Mary Slusser of Calabar, Pioneer Missionary by W.P. Livingston. Chapter 15 Storming the Citadels. The government road went as far as Odoro Akpi, where a rest house, used as a shelter by officials on the march or on, or on judging tours, and the one seen by Mr. McGregor, had been built on the brow of a hill above the township. It was Saturday when she arrived there, and she had climbed the ascent, taken over an hour to do it, and was captivated by the situation. It had the widest outlook of any spot she had seen, and she seemed to be on the very roof of the world. A vast extent of bush stretched out before her, unbroken save by the white road winding down the hill, and instead of the stifling stillness of the plains, a soft breeze blew and cooled the atmosphere. It was five miles from Ikepi, and the center of a number of populous towns. For months past she had been praying for an entrance into those closed haunts of heathenism, and as she sat down in the lonely little rest house, she made up her mind not to move a step further until she had come to grips with the chiefs. Knowing that the government would not object, she took possession of the building. It had a doorway, but no door. The windows were holes in the wall high up under the eaves. The floor was of mud, and there was no furniture of any kind. But these things were of no consequence to the gypsy missionary. She slept on a camp bed borrowed from Miss Peacock. Girls lay on the mud floor among the lizards, and some pots and pans were obtained from the people until she could procure her own from Ikepi. The commissioner department was run on the simplest scale. A tin of fat, some salt and pepper, tea and sugar, and roasted plantain for bread, formed the principal constituents of the frugal meals. Their clothes were taken off piece by piece as each could be spared, and washed in a pail from the little prison yard. Ma's calico gown went through the process in the forenoon, was dried on the fence in the hot sun, and donned in the afternoon, in order, as she humorously put it, to be ready for visitors and tea. In her eyes it was a sort of glorified picnic. She did not pity the girls. She thought such an experience was better for them as African citizens and missionaries than a secondary education. From this high center, as from a fort, she began to bombard the towns in the neighborhood. Next day she summoned some disciples from a place called Indat, and service was held in the yard. Then the lads pushed her chair out to Ibam, two miles distance, where she met the headman and his followers. These were an arrogant, powerful sept, not Ibibos, who had been allies of the slavers of Eros, and were disliked and suspected by all. She told them that she wanted the question of gospel entrance settled. They looked at her indulgently. "'We have no objection to you coming, Ma,' said the chief. "'And the saving of twins, and the right of twin mothers to live as woman and not as unclean beasts in the bush?' she asked. "'No, we will not have it. Our town will spoil.' After much talk, they said, "'Go home, Ma, and we shall discuss it and see you again.' The native way of ending a matter. Her next discussion was with the town of Odoro Ikepi itself. The old chief was urbane and gave her every honor. Bringing out a plate with money upon it, he said, Take that to buy food while staying here, as we have no market yet. She took the money, kissed it, put her hands on his head, and thanked him, calling him father, but requested him to take it and buy chop for the children, and she would eat with him another day. The old man went away and returned with some yams, which he asked her to cook and eat. As they talked, he gradually lost his fear, and then she asked him bluntly about his attitude to the gospel. He and his big men told her frankly he and his big men told her frankly what their difficulties were, and these she demolished one by one. After two hours fencing and arguing, the tension gave way to a hearty laugh, and the old chief said, with a sweep of his hand toward the crowd, Well, Ma, there they are. Take them and teach them what you like, and you, young men, go and build a house for book. No, cried Ma, we don't begin or end either way with a house. We begin and end with God in our hearts. A young man came forward and without removing a quaint hat he wore, said, Ma, we can't take God's word if you bring twins and twin mothers into our town. It was out at last. Ma looked at him as witheringly as she could and replied, I speak with men and people worthy of me, and not with the puny bush boy such as you have shown by your manners you are. Off came the hat, and then Ma spoke to him in such a way that the crowd was fain to cry, Ma, forgive, forgive, he does not know any better. There was no more after that about twins, and when she left, she felt the progress had been made. Striking while the iron was hot, she sent to Ikepi for school books, and going into the highways and byways, she began to coax the lads to come and learn. They stood aloof, half afraid and half scornful, and would not respond. Then she adopted a flank movement, and began to speak to them about the rubber and cocoa which the government was planting in the district, and tried to awaken their interest and ambitions by telling them how the world was moving outside their home circle. Gradually the sullenness gave way, 
and they began to ask questions and to chat. She took the alphabet card, but they shied at the strange-looking thing and would not speak. One little fellow, who had been at Ikepe and knew more than the others, began tremblingly, A, B, and she and Alice, who was with her, joined in until one after another surrendered, and before long all were shouting the letters. By the end of the week, the lads were coming every spare hour for lessons, and would scarcely give her time to eat. The Ikepe disciples had ruefully watched this development, and at last went to Ma. Ma, we are glad you've got a footing out here, but are you forsaking us? Her heart ached at the words, and although now reduced to coming and going in her cape cart, she determined to give them every alternate week when she was not at use. Thus from now onward she was keeping three centers going by her own efforts. After a week at Ikepe, in fulfillment of her promises, she returned to Odoro Ikepe to hold the first Sabbath service. A play was being enacted in the town, and scores of naked young men and women were dancing to the compelling throb of the drum. But some Ikepe and Indot lads came to support the service, and their presence helped the local sympathizers to come forward. It was very simple, she said. It would have seemed babyish to Europeans, but it was an epic to the natives. After meetings were held in the afternoon, and at night in the dark square, lit only by the light of the fires where the women were cooking their meal, she stood, and again proclaimed, with passionate earnestness, the love of God and the power of Christ to save and uplift. It was, no doubt, a day of small things, but she knew from long experience that small things were not to be despised. A month later, when she was at Ikepe holding the services, she was astonished to see thirty of the Odoro Ikepe lads marching to church. They had grown so interested that they had come the five miles to hear her speak. The Ikepe people at once rose and gave the strangers their seats, finding a place for themselves on the floor. It was pathetic to see their earnest faces and their ignorance as, as to what they should do during the service, which was more elaborate than they had been accustomed to. Having brought some food, they cooked it at the house and remained all day. On her return to Odora Ikepe, the chiefs appeared one morning, and asked her to come out at once and survey the land, and choose a site for a station. Her heart leapt at the significance of their quest. She happened to be in her night attire, but, as it might have been full court dress for all they knew, she went and tramped over to the land, and chose what she believed would be the best situation in the mission. It was on the brow of a hill overlooking a magnificent stretch of country, across which a cool breeze blew all the time. She immediately planned a house, one of six rooms, three living rooms above, and stores, and hall and girls' rooms below, with a roof of corrugated iron for security against wind and insects, and prepared to go down to use to buy the material. There was one town still holding out, Ibam, where she had been told to go home and they would think about it. And she prayed that it, too, might accept the new conditions. On the Sunday before she left for use, while she was conducting service, six strange men came in and waited until all had gone. "'We are from Ibam,' they said. "'Come at once, Ma, and we will build a place to worship God, and we will hear and obey.' She was so uplifted that she seemed to live on air for the next few days. The villagers of Ibam gave up their best yard to her, and crowds came to the meetings. All the citadels of heathenism in the district had now been stormed. Sitting one night on the floor of the rest house, her aching back leaning against the mud wall, a candle stuck in its own grease, giving her light, she wrote to her friends in Scotland, telling them that she was the happiest and most grateful woman in the world. Chapter 16 Clarion Calls the discovery of coal up in the interior at Udai brought a new interest into her life, for her far-seeing mind at once realized all the possibilities it contained. She believed it would revolutionize the conditions of West Africa, and when a railway was projected and begun from Port Harcourt west of Calabar to Udai, and there was talk of an extension to Aitu, she sought to make her friends at home grasp the full significance of the development. That railway would become the highway to the interior, and Calabar would cease to be so important a port. Great stretches of rich palm oil country would be opened up and exploited. She urged the need for more men and women to work amongst the rank heathenism that would soon collect and fester in the new industrial and commercial centers. Up there also was the menace of Mohammedism. Shall the cross or the crescent be first, she cried. We need men and women. Oh, we need them. She had been saddened by the closing of stations for furloughs and the apathy of the church at home. We are lower in numbers in Calabar than ever, fewer if you accept the artisans in the Institute, than in the old days before the doors were opened. Surely there is something very far wrong with our church, the largest in Scotland. Where are the men? Are there no heroes in the making amongst us? 
No hearts beating high with the enthusiasm of the gospel. Men smile nowadays at the old-fashioned idea of sin and hell and broken law in a perishing world. But these made men, men of purpose, of power and achievement, and self-denying devotion to the highest ideals earth has known. We have really no workers to meet all this open country. And our church, to be honest, should stand back and give it to someone else. But oh, I can't think of that. Not that, Lord. For how could we meet the Goldies, the Eggerleys, the Waddells, the Andersons? How can our church look at Christ, who has given us the privilege of making Calabar history, and say to him, Take it back. Give it to another. She had been deeply interested in the Great World's Missionary Conference in Edinburgh in 1910, and had contrasted it with state diplomacy and dreadnoughts, but was disappointed that so little practical result had followed. After all, she said, it is not committees and organizations from without that is to bring the revival and to send the gospel to the heathen at home and abroad, but the living spirit of God working from within the heart. All this made her more than ever convinced of the value of her own policy. She believed in the roughest methods for a raw country like Nigeria. Too much civilization and concentration was bad, both for the work and the natives. There should be, she thought, an office of itinerating or traveling missionaries permanently attached to the mission. It would have its drawbacks, as she recognized all pioneer work had, but it would also pay well. She was not sure whether the missionaries did right in remaining closely to their stations, and believed that shorter regular expeditions into the interior would not only keep them in better health, but give them a closer knowledge of the people. Not much teaching could be given in this way, but their confidence would be won, and the way would be prepared for further advance. Her hope lay in women workers. They made better pioneers than men, as they were under no suspicion of being connected with their government. Their presence was unobjectionable to the natives. They could move into new spheres and do the spade work, enter the homes, win a hearing, guide the people in quiet ways, and live a simple and natural life amongst them. When confidence had been secured, men missionaries could enter, and train and develop, and build up congregations in the ordinary manner. Even then, she did not see why elaborate churches should be erected. She was always so afraid to put anything forward save Christ that she was quite satisfied with her little mud kirks. The raw heathen knew nothing of the church as white people understood it. To give them a costly building was to give them a foreign thing in which they would worship a foreign god. To let them worship in an environment of their own setting meant, she believed, a more real apprehension of spiritual truth. The money they were trained to give she would spend, not on buildings so much as on pioneer work among the tribes. So too with the mission houses. She thought these should be as simple as possible and semi-native in style. Such, she believed, to be the driest and most healthy. In any case, disease could come into a house costing 200 pounds as into one costing 20 pounds. And there was such a thing as God's providence. Still, she recognized the importance of preserving the health of newcomers and admitted that her huts might not apply to them, to insist on mud huts for a nervous person. It was much the same feeling that ran through her objections to the natives suddenly transforming themselves into Europeans. Her views in this respect differed a great deal from those of her co-workers. On Sunday, after a special service, a number of women who had arrayed themselves in cheap European finery, boots and stockings and all, called upon her. She sat on a chair, her back to them, and merely threw them an occasional word with an angry jerk of her head. They were very upset, and at last one of them ventured to ask what was the matter. Matter, she exclaimed, and then spoke to them in a way which brought them all back in the afternoon clothed more appropriately. On all these questions, she thought simply and naturally, and not in terms of scientific theory and over-elaborated system. She believed that the world was burdened and paralyzed by conventional methods, but she did not undervalue the aesthetic side of existence. So many think that we missionaries live a sort of glorified glamour of a life, and have no right to think of any of the little refinements and elegancies which rest and soothe tired and overstrung nerves. Certainly coarseness and ugliness do not help the Christian life, and ugly things are not, as a rule, cheaper than beautiful ones. Her conviction was that a woman worth her salt would make any kind of house beautiful. At the same time, she believed, and proved it in her own life, that the spirit-filled woman was to a great extent independent of all accessories. What always vexed her was to think of thousands of girls at home living a purposeless life, spending their time in fashionable wintering places, and undergoing the strenuous toil of conventional amusement. Why, she asked, could they not come out here and stay a month or six months doing light work, helping with the children, cheering the staff? What a wealth of interest it would introduce into their lives. She declared it would be better than stoning windows, for she had no patience with the policy of women who sought in blind destruction the solution of political and social laws. I have a vote for women, but I would prove my right to it by keeping law and helping others to keep it. Godlike motherhood is the finest sphere for women and the way to the redemption of the world. 
many a clarion bell she sent to her sisters across the waters. Don't grow up a nervous old maid. Gird yourself for the battle outside somewhere, and keep your heart young. Give up your whole being to create music everywhere, in the light places and in the dark places, and your life will make melody. I am a witness to the perfect joy and satisfaction of a single life. With the tale of human tag-rag hanging on, it is rare. It is as exhilarating as an aeroplane or a dirigible, or whatever they are that are always trying to get up and are always coming down. Mine has been such a joyous service, she wrote again. God has been good to me, letting me serve him in this humble way. I cannot thank him enough for the honor he conferred upon me when he sent me to the dark continent. Over and over again she put this idea of foreign service before her friends at home. Some were afraid of a rush of cranks who would not obey the rules, and so forth. She had laughed the idea to scorn. I wish I could believe in a crush, but there are sensible men and women enough of the church who would be as law-abiding here as at home. Chapter 17. Love Letters During the course of her career, Miss Lesser wrote numberless letters, many of them productions of six, ten, twelve, and fourteen pages, closely penned in spidery writing, which she called her hieroglyphic style. She had the gift, which more women than men possess, of expressing her ideas on paper, in as affluent and graceful a way as in conversation. Her letters indeed were long monologues, the spontaneous outpouring of an active and clever mind. She sat down and talked vivaciously of everything about her, not of public affairs, because she knew people at home would not understand about these, but of her children, the natives, her journeys, her ailments, the services, the palivars, all as simply and naturally, and as full as if she were addressing an interested listener. But it was essential that her correspondent should not be in sympathy with her. She could never write a formal letter. She could not even compose a business letter in the ordinary way. Neither could she write to order, nor give an official report of her work. The prospect of appearing in print paralyzed her. It was always the heart and not the mind of her correspondent that she addressed. What happened from time to time in the record in the woman's missionary magazine were mainly extracts from private letters, and they derived all their charming color from the fact that they were meant for friends who loved and understood her. In the same way she could be chilled by receiving a coldly expressed letter, I wish you hadn't said, dear madam, she told a lady at home, I am just an insignificant, wee, old wifey that you never address in that way if you knew me. I'll put the madame aside, and drag up my clerk close to you, and the girls you write for, and we'll have a chat by the fireside. She could not help writing. It was the main outlet for her loving nature, so much repressed in the loneliness of the bush. Had she not possessed so big and so ardent a heart, she would have written less. Into her letters she poured all the wealth of her affection. They were in the real sense love letters and her magic gift of sympathy made them always prized by the recipients. She had no home people of her own, and she pressed her nearest friends to make her one of the family. If, she would say, you would let me share in any disappointments or troubles, I would feel more worthy of your love. I will tell you some of mine as a counter-irritant. Many followed her behest with good result. I'm cross this morning, wrote a young missionary at the beginning of a long letter, and I know it is all my own fault, but I am sure that writing to you will put me in a better temper. When things go wrong, there is nothing like a talk with you. Now, I must stop. The letter has worked the cure. Her letters of counsel to her colleagues when they were in difficulties with the work were helpful and inspiring to the highest degree. On occasions of trial or sorrow, she always knew the right word to say. How delicately, for instance, would she try to take the edge off the grief of bereaved friends by describing the arrival of the Spirit in heaven, and the glad welcome that would be got there for those who had gone before. Heaven is just a meeting and a homing of our real selves. God will never make us into new personalities. Everlasting life. Take that word life and turn it over and over, and press it and try to measure it, and see what it will yield. It is a magnificent idea which comprises everything that the heart can yearn for. On another occasion she wrote, I do not like that petition in the prayer book. From sudden death, good Lord deliver us. I never could pray it. It is truly far better to see him at once without pain of parting or physical debility. Why should we not be like the Apostle in his confident outburst of praise and assurance? For I am persuaded. Again, don't talk about the cold hand of death. It is the hand of God. It was not surprising that her correspondence became greater at last than she could manage. The pile of unanswered communication was like a millstone round her neck, and in the latter days she began to violate an old rule and snatch time from the hours of night. Headings such as 10 p.m., midnight, 8.45 a.m. became frequent, yet she would give love's full measure to every correspondent, and there was seldom sign of undue strain. If my pen is in a hurry, she would say, my heart is not. When she was ill and unable to write, she would simply lie in bed and speak to her father about it all. There was a number of friends to whom she wrote regularly, and whose relations to her may be judged from the manner in which she began their letters. My Lady of Grace. 
my beloved missionary, dear sister, were some of the phrases used, but her nature demanded at least one confidant to whom she could bear her innermost thoughts. She needed a safety valve, a city of refuge, a heart and mind with whom there would be no reservations, and Providence provided her with such a kind of confessor from whom she obtained all the understanding and sympathy and love she craved. This was Miss Adam, who, while occasionally differing from her in minor matters of policy, never, during the fifteen years of their friendship, once failed her. What she was to the lonely missionary, no one can know. Mary said she knew, without being told, what was in her heart, and how sweet, she added, it is to be understood, and have love reading between the lines. Month by month she sent to Bowden the intimate story of her doings, her troubles, hopes, and fears, and joys, and received in return wise and tender counsel, and encouragement and practical help. She kept the letters under her pillow, and read and reread them. Never self-centered or self-sufficient, she depended upon the letters that came from home to a greater extent than many of her friends suspected. She needed the inflow of love into her own life, and she valued the letters that brought her cheer and stimulus and inspiration. Once she was traveling on foot, and had four miles of uphill road to go, and was feeling very weary and depressed at the magnitude of the work and her own weakness, when a letter was handed to her. It was the only one by mail, but it was enough. She sat down, and in the quiet of the bush she opened it, and as she read, all the tiredness fled, the heat was forgotten, the road was easy, and she went blithely up the hill. Outside the circle of her friends, many people wrote to her from Scotland, and some from England, Canada, and America. Boys and girls whom she had never seen sent her letters telling her of their cats and dogs, of football and lessons in school. Well, with her replies sometimes went a snakeskin, a brass tray, a miniature paddle, or other curio. But it was the letter, rather than the gift, that was enjoyed. As one girl wrote, "'You are way out helping the poor black kitties and people, and just as busy doing good as possible.' and yet you've time to send a letter home to a little Scottish girl, a letter fragrant with everything lovely and good, and that makes one try harder than ever to do right, and that fills one's heart with beautiful, helpful thoughts. To her own barons, wherever they were, she wrote letters full of household news and gentle advice. To Dan at the Institute she wrote regularly, very pleased she was when she heard he had been at lectures on bacteria and understood them. And when Alice and Maggie were inmates of the Eckerley Memorial School, she kept in close touch with them. Here is a specimen of her letters, written chiefly in Evic, and addressed apparently to Alice. My precious children, I am thinking a lot about you, for you will soon be losing our dear Miss Young, and while I am sorry for myself, I am sorry for you and Calabar. How are you all, and have you been good, and are you all trying to serve and please Jesus your Lord? Whitey has gone to sleep. She has been making sand, and yonoying my bedroom, the bit that you did not finish. Janie has yonodi the high bits, so Whitey is very tired. Jeanie has gone to stay all night with the twin mother and her baby in the town where Ephom used to live long ago. One baby is dead, but she's keeping the other, and the chief says, Ma, you are our mother, but what you have done will be the death of us. The mother almost died. One child was born dead, and Jeanie and I stayed all night there. Mary is at Icot Ikpen. We saw her as we passed in the motor. The whole town came today and put splendid beams in the veranda, both in front and behind, swept all behind, and put on corrugated iron roof, did the porch and various other things, and the safe. Goodbye. Are you all well? We are well, through God's goodness. Are you coming home for holidays? My heart is hungry to see you and to touch your hands. Greetings to Ma Fuller. Greet Ma Wilkie and Mr. Wilkie for me. Greet each other. All we greet you. With much love to Maggie, Dan, I, and all my prayers, your mother, M. Slesser. The girls and Dan also wrote regularly to her, in letters, as this. I am pleased to send this little letter to you. Are you well? I am fairly well, through the goodness of God. Why have you delayed to send us a letter? Perhaps you are too busy to write, but we are coming home in a fortnight. If you hear we are on the way, come quickly out when you hear the voices of the people from the beach, because you know it will be us. Greet Whitey, Janie, Annie, and all, and accept greetings from your loving child, Maggie. After her death, there was found at use a bundle of letters, evidently much treasured, labeled, my children's letters. Chapter 18. A Lonely Figure She returned to use, but only remained long enough to arrange for the material for the house at Odoro Akpi. Of the special difficulties that would beset her on this occasion, she was quite aware. The timber supply on the ground was scarce. Transport would be expensive. There was no local skilled labor, and she was unable to work with her own hands since it was not easy to procure carriers and other working people, since the government, with the consent of the chiefs, were taking batches of men from each village for the coal fields and railway, a measure she approved, as it prevented the worst elements of the community drifting there. 
But nothing ever discouraged her, and she returned at the end of April and embarked once more, and for the last time, on building operations. Friends kept tempting her to come to Scotland. Her friend Miss Young was now Mrs. Arnott, wife of the Reverend David Arnott, M.A., and from her came a pressing invitation to come home at Manse. I will meet you at Liverpool, Miss Arnott wrote, and bring you straight here, where you will rest and be nursed back to health again. It was proposed that Alice should come with her, and be left with Mrs. Arnott, while Mary visited her friends. She was delighted, and wrote gaily that when she did come, she would not be a week-end visitor, or a tea visitor, but a barnacle. It is, however, all too alluring. One thing can overtop it, and that is duty, as put into my hands by my king. Then she painted a picture of the piles of timber and corrugated iron about her for the building of the house, for the happy and privileged man or woman who should take up the work of salvage, and of Ikepe waiting patiently, and the town surrendering on all sides, and adds, put yourself in my place, and with an ascension of strength given since I camped up here, how could you do other than I have done? I verily thought to be with the McGregors, but this came, and the strength has come with it, and there must be no more moving till the house is up, when I hope and pray someone will come to it. What a glorious privilege it all is. I can't think why God has so highly honored and trusted me. She entered on a period of toil and tribulation, which proved to be one of the most trying and exacting in her life. The house itself was a simple matter. Large posts were inserted in the ground, and split bamboos were placed between. Cross pieces were tied on with strips of the oil palm tree, and then clay was prepared and pounded in. But fifty men and lads were employed, and she had never handled so lazy, so greedy, so inefficient a gang. Compelled to supervise them constantly, she often had to sit in the fierce sunshine for eight hours at a time. Then, with face unwashed and sharp morning wrapper still on, she would go and conduct school. If she went to Ikeby for a day, all the work done required to be gone over again. Sometimes she lost all patience, and resorted to a little muscular Christianity, which caused huge amusement, but always had the desired effect. But she was very philosophical over it. It is all part of the heathen character, and, as Mrs. Anderson used to say, Well, Daddy, if they were Christians here, there would have been no need for you and me here. Jean often became very wroth, and demanded of the people if Ma was not to obtain time to eat, and if they wanted to kill her. Annie and her husband had been placed at Inkenga, and Jean now managed the household affairs. The faithful girl had her own difficulties in the way of catering, for on account of the isolation money frequently ran down, and she could not obtain the commonest necessities to feed her Ma. An empty purse always worried Mary, but it was a special trial to her independent and sensitive spirit at this period, for she was in debt to the skilled carpenter who had been engaged, and to the laborers, and was compelled to undergo the humiliation of borrowing. On one occasion she obtained a loan of five shekels from one of her rare visitors, a government doctor, a Scot and a Presbyterian, who was investigating tropical diseases, and who, finding her in the rest house, had contentedly settled down with his microscopes in the courthouse shed. After working all day in the bush, he spent many evenings with her, and she was much impressed by his upright character, and his kindness and courtesy to the natives, and said matters would be very different in Africa, if all civil and military men were of the same stamp. The only other two visitors she had at this time were Mr. Bowes, the printer at Duke Town, and Mr. Hart, the accountant, the latter bringing her all the money she needed. By the end of July the house was roughly built, and she was able to mount up to the top rooms by means of a hen's ladder. And there, on the loose, unsteady boards, she sat tending her last motherless baby, and feeling uplifted into a new and restful atmosphere. A pathetic picture she made, sitting, gazing over the wide African plain. She had never been more isolated, never felt more alone. So lonely t'was the God himself, scarce seemed there to be. She was without assistance, her body was broken and pitifully weak, and yet with dauntless spirit and quenchless faith, she looked hopefully to the future, when those infant stations about her would be occupied by consecrated men and women.